All right. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Before we get started, I want to mention the men's Bible study. Tuesday night, I can put a shameless plug because I'm teaching it. Uh, We have between 85 and 90 signed up. Um, We'll be meeting in this room from 6.30 to 8 o'clock for six out of seven Tuesday nights. We take spring break week off so that dads don't have to worry about missing a week. So guys, we're studying the life of Joseph. I've taught this in three different churches. One time it took me 36 weeks to get through the life of Joseph. It took one complete calendar year when you count the special gatherings, guest speakers, God showing up, worship going long, all those kind of things. But it took us 36 weeks to get through it. It was literally from March, the end of March, to the following 1st of April. So I, I love the study, and I challenge you, encourage you to be there. Some important facts as we start this morning regarding the city of, this is the church, or the letter to the church of Smyrna, the second one. First letter was to the church of Ephesus. Smyrna was destroyed by the Lydians in 600 BC and rebuilt by the successors of Alexander the Great almost 300 years later in 290 BC. So not very often is a city destroyed and rebuilt three centuries later, but it was. It competed with Ephesus and Pergamum for being the principal city of the Asian province of Asia, or the Roman province of Asia. It had an influential harbor, was a port city, and unlike Ephesus, which was on the coast, Ephesus continually was filled in with dredge from the, or sand from the river. Um, Smyrna wasn't. Ephesus constantly had to be dredged. And finally, now if you go to Ephesus, it's off the coast because it's literally filled in by the river. Smyrna was a major supplier of the gum resin extract myrrh. It's one of the three gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus. I once heard there was a fourth wise man, but he brought a fruitcake. And so uh, he's not remembered in history, but uh, that's another story. Myrrh was used as a medicine. It removed impurities. If you remember the story of Esther, she took a myrrh bath for 10 days, or I think it was maybe three months, 90 days. Part of the myrrh would draw out impurities in the body. It was an anti-inflammatory. It was a perfume, and it was especially used in times of death because it covered the stench of bodies. Very important in the Roman Empire. It was very hard to get. Trees were scarred. They would produce this gum. The gum was taken, dried, then ground into powder. The powder was then put put into some type of oil, and it became a perfume or substance that way. They were very loyal to Rome. The commercial enterprise of a temple was built to the Roman Caesars, and uh, they had been bestowed by the Roman Empire as being a temple guardian city. Unlike Ephesus, again, Ephesus had the temple of Diana, which was the daughter of Zeus. This is to the Roman emperors, so it's a very important city. It also had a large secular Jewish population, ethnic Jews, but not practicing. Concerning the letter, it was written by John, spoken by Jesus. If you have a Bible and you open it up and you have a red letter Bible, this section of scripture is in red. Why is that? Duh. Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. And so that's important for us to understand. These weren't just some, one of the prophets or one of the writers of the New Testament. John is describing or scribing what Jesus told him. It's the second of seven letters. It's the shortest. It's only three verses. And it's the one of two letters, that being to the church of Philadelphia that has no rebuke in it. There was no like you gotta do something better. It's similar language to Philadelphia also in that the synagogue of Satan or the seat of Satan is in this city. I must assume from that that God had nothing to edit in their life. There was no rebuke, there was no challenge to get better on something. God is pleased with us. And yet the theme 
to the letter of the church of Smyrna is suffering. If you think God's pleased with you, how many of you think you ought to get suffering? No, most of us, if God is pleased, then things go really well for us. But how many of you know, Job says, shall I receive blessing and not curses or bad from the Lord? I can receive both. And so life is full of suffering, and that's what this letter is really about. Let's stand and read these four verses together. I said three, it's four. Write this letter to the angel or the messenger of the church of Smyrna. And the name Smyrna was derived from myrrh also, which is interesting. This is a message from the one who is the first and the last, who is dead but now is alive. I know three things. I know your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who are opposing you, who say they are Jews, but they are not, because they, their synagogue belongs to Satan. Second thing, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. How many of you want the Lord to appear, write a letter to you, put the letters in red and say, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer? How many would like that? Yeah, yeah you're lying. <laughs> That's not the truth. Most of us don't like those. I shouldn't say that. I would be lying. It's like, oh, yes, Lord, thank you for the encouragement of, um, about what I'm about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even in facing death, then I will give you the crown of life. Anyone who has ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. God bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The challenge of most of the letters, the five letters besides this letter to Smyrna and Philadelphia is this, don't become like the culture you're living in. I mean, believe that's a good message and hard to live sometimes. The challenge to Smyrna is not I know your works, but I know your suffering. That should bring comfort to us. Paul states in Romans 817, he says, we are partakers of Christ's glory, but we're also partakers of what? Christ's suffering. We all want the fellowship of the resurrection, as, as it says in Philippians 4 or 3. We all want the fellowship of his resurrection, the power, but we don't want the fellowship of his sufferings. But it's part of life, the mystery of suffering. If you're asking for an answer to your suffering, you will never get a satisfactory one. And I always say this, people say, well, I'll ask the Lord in heaven. I always, you hear me say this all the time. When you get to heaven, you won't care. You won't care anymore because you're going to see the one who is the prince of peace, the one who's secured your salvation for you. Suffering means this, to torment, to trouble, to bewilder, to confuse, to worry, to plague, and it's usually associated, all of those things are associated with physical pain. You will never understand or get an answer. Remember in John 9, the man born blind? Remember what they said? Who sinned, this man or his parents? A baby born blind because he said from birth he was blind and now he's 40 years old. So for four decades, he lived a life of not being able to see. And the disciples, the apostles said to Jesus, who sinned, this man did he sin? There's gotta be a reason for his suffering. This man sinned or his parents sinned? There had to be a reason, Jesus said neither. It's for the glory of God. And yet there is a suffering by our own choice. I had a friend in high school, two siblings, and his parents all smoked several packs of cigarettes a day. They all died before they reached 65. About 30 years ago, he decided to quit smoking. He's a couple years older than me, and he's still alive. Now, we could say, why did God allow cancer to come on those people? Because they smoked several packs of cigarettes a day. Now, is God out to get them? No. It's like there's blessing and cursing. 
curses. If you do certain things, you will, you know, I love what Pastor Greg said when I first started attending Vintage. He said, ask yourself, what's the run rate of that sin I'm committing? What's going to be the end of my life? If you read Proverbs chapter four through seven, it's like, don't follow the adulterous woman. Don't sleep with a prostitute because in the end of life, you're going to go, why did I do that? I spent my life chasing this. I've chased this and I chased that and somebody else has enjoyed the fruit of my own labors. Somebody else has enjoyed my wealth, my vitality. God's not out to get you, never. If we set certain things in motion, there will, I I say it all the time, if I jump off a building and repent halfway before I hit the ground, I'm forgiven of my sin of stupidity, but I'll probably break both legs when I hit the ground. Had nothing to do with God. Had to do with my actions. That's not what we're talking about here at, at the Church of Smyrna. They are suffering because their choices to serve God. Let's look at this verse by verse. This is the message of the one who is the first and the last, who is dead but is now alive. It's a direct quote from Isaiah 44. I would encourage you to go look at Isaiah 44. It's one of my favorite Old Testament passage. Isaiah says this. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last. There's no other God. When people say Jesus isn't God, he's directly quoting Isaiah 44, which is no dispute of who Jehovah God is. Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. God says, I'm the first and the last. God the Father. Who is like me? Let him step forward and prove his power. Let him do as I have done since the ancient times and establish a people and explain the future. None of us can do that. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witness. There is no other God but me. No, there's no other rock, not one. If you read the rest of the chapter, it's very almost comical. God says somebody takes a piece of wood, they cut it in half. With half of it, they cook their breakfast. The other half, they make an idol. And yet they never see the stupidity of that. I just cooked my breakfast on half of my idol. <laughs> Isaiah is mocking them. He says, wake up. There's no other God beside me. We need to understand that. Revelation, when we looked at chapter 1, verses 8, 17, and 18 says this. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I'm the one who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as I was a dead man. But he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am living, I died, but look, I'm alive forevermore and I hold the keys to death and the grave. Jesus is saying, I was once dead and now I'm alive, therefore you can have faith in the midst of the suffering because some of you are gonna die for your faith. None of us Americans, of course. How do we know? Why do we say those that are in other countries are going to suffer for their faith, but we never, it will never touch our shores? Just a sobering reminder, none of us are promised that. We've got to understand, do I relish that? No. No. And by the way, some of you are like, I don't know if I could stand for my faith. If somebody said, deny Christ, you're going to die. You're not being asked to right now. There'll be grace when you need it, if you need it. I'm not pronouncing judgment and woe. I'm not prophesying that we're going to suffer persecution, but I think we might. How many of you pray for those in what is called the 1040 window? I pray for them almost every week those that have, are facing martyrdom this very moment, that are living for Christ with the threat of their families being taken, their livelihood being taken, their life being taken, their health being taken. And yet we say, oh, I believe in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I always tell people who says. 
It's an ideal, but it's not a promise from God. Matter of fact, the writers of the document didn't even believe it. Why? Because they didn't have, they had people that they owned that were not practicing. They weren't giving them the ability to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Does that make them evil? Sort of. <laughs> Makes them evil in the sense that they didn't have the sense to know what they're doing. I believe in that document. I praise God for that document. But for us to believe that because I'm an American, I have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness when my brothers in China or Iran or North Korea are suffering for their faith, God didn't give them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Because the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of what makes me happy. If there's anything wrong with us right now, is we all are pursuing what makes us happy. Now, I understand that in, in 6, 1776, happiness had the concept of God being in the equation. But the fact is, none of us have been promised life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We've been promised one thing. In this life, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome. Boy, you're Debbie Downer today, Pastor Gary. I actually ask for this text, of pa this passage of Scripture. See, my lifetime Scripture is out of Timothy. Timothy, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, endure hardship. Oh, Lord, is there another lifetime Scripture? Yeah, endure hardship. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, that you may please the one who has enlisted you. It's kind of like volunteering. My dad used to, and he was in the military, he used to say sometimes volunteering was everybody step forward that wants to volunteer. Those that didn't were the ones that volunteered. You take a step forward, everybody that didn't behind you were the ones that they said, okay, those behind, those that volunteered are now volunteered. I am the first and the last, and I always say he's the God of the in-between. I always talk about the tweener times. Anybody know what a tweener time is? A tweener time is when God has given you a promise and you're waiting for it to be fulfilled. That's the in-between time. That's a tweener time. And that's when faith is tested. In the tweener times, say that five times, you baptize baptized in the Holy Ghost. Anyway, <laughs> you almost speak in tongues. Tweener times, tweener times, tweener times. You got it. Yes, you do. My point is, it's in that time of testing that our faith is tested. I love the fact when he says, get in the boat, you're going to encounter a storm that they didn't know, but he did, and he put him in the boat. Verse 9, I know about your suffering. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who oppose you. The thing that's so incredible is this. In verse 8, Jesus gives the contrast between the Roman emperors and the empire and him. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Do you realize the Roman Empire had about another 400 years before, and I know it's four centuries, before they are totally collapsed? We're pushing, what, 270, 80 years now? Do you realize that is a drop in the bucket when it comes to I am the first and the last? The second thing he says is I know everything about you. I am intimately acquainted with you. How do you believe that's true? Until something happens we don't like. I know your afflictions and your challenges. I know your poverty. Can somebody say, thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Not only spiritual poverty, but physical poverty. I know your poverty, and yet in me, you're rich. It's not about money. It's not about possessions. It's about who, you, who possesses you. I know your afflictions. I know your challenges. I know your poverty, but you are rich. 
Blessed are the poor and realize their need of him, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I love that translation. Blessed are the poor and those that have need of him. Does anybody in this room besides me, you don't have to raise your hand, find it easier sometimes to serve God in the midst of the trial than it is when everything's going hunky-dory? And he goes, I know the slander and the blasphemy that's been given to you. You know what slander is? It's actually truth spoken in a way or twisted to bring harm to the person that's, that is being talked about. I have some truths about me that somebody could twist or take out of context or drop one line to you, and it would totally make a different picture of who I really am. The enemy is great at taking a portion of Scripture and throwing that in your face, but taking it out of context. The enemy will take your past and take a section of your past and throw it in your face. The slander, the blasphemy, I know. Verse 9, they say they are Jews, but they are not because they belong to the synagogue of Satan. Ooh, boy. Let me say this. This is a not, not a statement to fuel anti-Semitism. Ian Paul, Dr. Ian Paul, who's going to be with us in April, who's a scholar, I love, matter of fact, a lot of the points I have here came from his commentary on the book of Revelation. He's going to be with us in April. He says this, this is, a, this is about being the people of God at heart. It is about faith and obedience, not ethnicity. It has nothing to do with the fact that they were Jews. It, had, it has to do with those that are saying they're Jews, but they're not. And it just struck me. If you study world history, there is a, it, it's, it's a oxymoron. It's, a, it's a, something that's so opposed to us when we're in the midst of it, but we see it happen time and time again, where the ones who were persecuted now become the persecutor. Throughout world history, people who were once oppressed when they have power now become the one who oppresses others. It's quiet, chewing food. We've got to be careful. That's the danger of being a Christian too long. You forget what it was like to get saved, you forget what you were saved from. And not to constantly throw it in your face, but the fact is all of us, all of us were on our way to hell at one time. Everybody in this room, whether you're a Christian or not, at one time in your life, either now as, as a non-believer or at one time you were someone who was on your way to hell. Your trespasses were counted against you because you didn't accept Jesus. And the danger is the church forgets what they're saved from and starts persecuting those that are in the same boat. We've got to be careful, church. That's what was happening here. This is a statement about Satan, the synagogue of Satan. Do you realize there's two names given to our enemy? One is Satan, one is the devil. Now, he's described as other things, but those are his two names. It's like my name is Gary, his name is Satan, or his name is devil. One means, Satan means accuser, devil means adversary. He is constantly accusing you, and he's constantly opposing you. I've had people say, you shouldn't talk about the devil, because he's, he's going to be mad at you, and he's going to go after you. Guess what? He's already after me. I don't mock him, but the fact is, I'm not afraid of him. But the accuser of the brethren, when you participate in accusation against another, you are part of the synagogue of Satan. You are accusing people using the very spirit that is his main weapon. If you study the book of Job, Job 1 says, Satan comes and appears before God. 
He does it also in the New Testament when he appears before God about Peter. But this time's about Job. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's upright. He's blameless. Again, if you read the book of Job, it's about suffering. What are Job's comforters? You did something wrong. You did something wrong, Job. Or God's mad. God's mean. Those are the two accusations. And they're no different to any of us. Either you did something wrong or God's mad at you. God's bad, bad God. It's a fact. And what the accuser does in in Job's case is he says he accuses God. He says, nah. He serves God for no reason. You protected him. Remove his wall of protection, and he'll curse you to to your face. Job's very wife, his wife said, curse God and die. And he said, shall I receive good from the Lord and not evil? I used to pitch on Job's wife till I realized one day she lost all four of her kids. God helped that mama. No wonder she felt cursed. All four kids died in a moment. They lost everything in a moment, and yet Job stayed steadfast. See, the accuser is this. I love what Pastor Greg said. Accusation is the plow that prepares the field to accept the seeds of division. That's good, man. Accusation is the plow that prepares the field's to accept the seeds of division. When you participate, when you speak evil of your brother and sister in the Lord, when you speak evil of another church, guess what you're doing? You're sowing seeds and you're plowing the fields for others to sow the seeds and you're participating with the accuser. Much like the church of Smyrna in a small regard, I went to this pastor's sort of one day retreat And the Lord spoke something to me very clearly. He said, Gary, you're going to go through something in the near future. But don't doubt my love. I thought, cool, awesome. (laughs) You know where my mind went instantly? Please, God, don't take my babies. Don't take my kids or my grandkids. Please. And in about a year, we went through something very hard. And you know what the enemy was? He used believers to attack us. He used accusations from others. Now, was there some truth? Yes, it was slander. Did I do everything right? No. But the fact is, the enemy had a partner, a willing partner, to take accusation and then sow the seeds, and others took it, and others, and others. And and I stood before people, and I said, like Jesus, a little bit, I understood the suffering of Christ in that. Have I been with you so long, and you still don't know who I am? You say, there's a lot of emotion. Yeah, there is. It's been over 10 years, and I still need healing to some of it. The deeper the cut, the more cleansing. Because if you don't keep the wound cleansed, it'll get infected. And then when it gets infected, it'll puke out on others. Because that's what bitterness does. The, The root of bitterness takes root, springs up, and says it spews to others. That's why I've said to you many times, that's why grandma's bitter, uncle's uncle's bitter, aunt's bitter, cousins are bitter, everybody's bitter in the family because somebody allowed a root of bitterness to come and puke on everybody else. Just spew it all over people. Oh boy. Revelation 12, 11 says, one day there's going to be the accuser of the brethren is going to be thrown down. Because he's accused them day and night. That's why Jesus constantly lives to make intercession to, for us. He makes intercession day and night because the accuser constantly accuses us. You don't need an enemy. You have one. Don't willingly participate with him for others. I'm done. Not really. I'm about a third of the way done. 
36 weeks. But notice what he says. I'm going to close. I'm going to wrap this up. Notice what he says. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. If I was the people in Smyrna, I'd be going, any other word out there? How about you are going to be delivered from suffering? How about I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord? Plans to prosper you and to give you hope. We had a word from the prayer team. It was all about hope. And I'm going, oh, man, I'm talking about suffering today. But see, as a believer, it's this. You can have hope in the midst of your suffering. Why? Because he's not asking you anything that you haven't, he hasn't gone through himself. I'm the first and the last. I died for my faith, and yet I'm alive. The one that endures to the end will not suffer the second death. What's the second death? It's hell. The first death is separation from the body. The second death is separation from God. You want to know what hell is? Hell is the opposite of what God is. God's not going to be in hell. Jesus is the living water. Jesus is light. It's going to be a place of intense thirst, a place of complete darkness. Everything that God is, hell is not. There was a guy by the name of Polycarp. Somebody said to me after the first gathering, I thought that was a dish. (laughs) Souffléed Polycarp. (laughs) Polycarp was a disciple of John who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the book of Revelation. He became the bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp was a young man when John was alive and wrote this book, probably in his early 20s. He died around 150, 170 AD. 60 years after the book of Revelation, he was martyred for his faith. They burned him alive and it didn't kill him. So a Roman soldier stabbed him. When Polycarp died at 86, it said that for 86 years he faithfully served God. What would happen if God gave us the word? I know what you are about ready to suffer. See, the 10 days wasn't a 10 days as we know it. 10 days means there's a beginning and there's an end. There's going to be an end to what you are going through. There's going to be an end. Whether you see Jesus or he delivers you, there's going to be an end. How would you like to be Polycarp that as a 20-year-old with all your dreams and your visions ahead of you, God says you're going to serve in a city that one day they're going to kill you for your faith. I thought it was come to Jesus and everything's just awesome. Come to Jesus and you know it's awesome because no matter what you go through, it is awesome. Because your perspective is not of this world, it's of from him. That's why the three Hebrew young man, men could say, we're not gonna bow. That's why throughout world history, there's been... Martyr after martyr after martyr after martyr that stood in the midst of their faith. And you say, Pastor, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can hand, hold on like Polycarp. Right now, God's not asking you. I guarantee as a 20-year-old, he didn't know what the next 60 years entailed for him. But I want to say to you, some of you, what will the next 60 years be for you? Will it be said, because the tomb of Polycarp still in Smyrna, that says, for 86 years, he faithfully served God. That's why Smyrna has no rebuke. Because believers willingly, willingly, we used to sing a song that one of my pastors in Texas found an old hymn and he put contemporary music to it. And it was what the Christians 
sang when they were being led into the Roman Colosseum, come let us adore our ever-living God and render praise unto him who set out the heavens. Think about it, church. If God asks any of us here to be martyrs, to be persecuted for our faith, there's grace. There's grace. There's grace. Because he has been faithful. Therefore, you and I can be faithful. That's it. <laughs>